Salvador is a movie made by Oliver Stone came out in 1986 and uh, was co-written by Oliver Stone and a guy called Richard Boyle. Richard Boyle was a photojournalist and uh, the story of Salvador is his story. Uh, it stars James Woods as Richard Boyle himself and uh, Jim Belushi as his friend Dr. Rock. It's going to be difficult to relate this story and do it justice. I tell you now, it's uh, very harrowing, it's very tragic, it's also extremely funny and it's uh, moving. I'd say the style of the movie is, I would call it docu-fiction. Um, how much it's been fictionalised, I can't say. Um, if Richard Boyle was really like that, it's surprising that he lived till uh, 2016 when he died in the Philippines because he's one hell of a crazy guy. He's a hustler. He admits himself to being a weasel, but he's also got a big heart and he really cares about the stories that he covers and gets involved with the people on a very deep kind of level. It seems that Richard Boyle was one of those old style photojournalists back in the 60s and 70s who went to Vietnam and Cambodia and had a free hand where they went, what they covered. After that, once you get into the later 80s and the first Gulf War of the 90s, the journalists seem to be much more controlled. Uh, they're placed within military units, for example, and uh, that kind of free-spirited, make-your-own-mind-up-about-things, we seem to have lost that. Journalists today seem to, uh, by and large, toe the line where back in those days, that was not what they were doing. They were finding out the truth for themselves, how they personally saw it and witnessed it. Introductions over. The beginning of the film starts with a flashing screen and what seems to be a, a massacre of people going on on the steps of a church. I would guess it's a cathedral possibly in San Salvador, the capital of El Salvador. And I don't know if this is real footage or this is uh, reenacted, but I have the sense that it is real. And I seem to remember seeing this footage, um, possibly on a news program or part of it, a long time ago, back in those days, back in the early 80s. So it could be real film. We don't know, I can't be sure, but it seems that way, and that's how the movie starts with the titles. Next we see Boyle waking up in bed. He's got a wife and a son in a little baby son in a crummy flat somewhere, and the landlord seems to be in the flat, and he's gesticulating and shouting because Boyle hasn't paid the rent. Uh, he doesn't have an assignment at the moment, so his wife's upset, the landlord's upset. Boyle lights a fag and uh, just kind of says, well, you know, uh, I'll pay you next week, you know, I'll, I'll do the best I can, but it doesn't seem to be going down too well. Then we see Boyle in the corridor where there's a public phone and he's uh, hustling to try and find a job talking to other journalists, I guess, and newsrooms saying, hey, you know, I was the last man out of Cambodia. I wrote a book. You know, I'm a good journalist. Didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? But he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere because he seems to have a really bad reputation. And it seems that that reputation is well earned. Next, we see him in his car and he's speeding through a... Uh, looks like San Francisco and he jumps over one of those hills there 
and uh, the cops are following him and they stop him and a woman policeman says, hey, you've got no driving licence, it's out of date, you've got speeding tickets, you've got parking fines, your car's totally illegal, I'm taking you in. And Boyle's like, well, you know, there's another Richard Boyle, it's not me, honestly, I'm, I'm a cool, you know, here's my press card. That's out of date too, everything's out of date. So they take him away and put him in the clink. Then we see him getting out of the clink, he's called out and uh, it looks like his mate Dr Rock, Jim Belushi, has turned up and he's bailing him out. Then we see them driving through San Francisco and they're smoking a spliff in this open top car and complaining about the yuppies, um, which was great because I remember those days and we were all complaining about the yuppies, those of us that were not yuppies because it looked like this materialistic, I've got money and a file of fax, remember file of faxes? Yeah, and we didn't like yuppies, we found them kind of ignorant, but uh, that's the way it goes. So they're complaining about yuppies and Boyle's saying, you know, let's go somewhere, let's go to Guatemala, you can do what you want down there, let's get out of it, there's no yuppies, let's get out of this town. and. Jim Belushi's like, well, I don't know, you know, I've got nowhere to live right now and I was hoping to stay with you, but Boyle says, I've got nowhere to live, I'm being evicted, so let's just take off and go to Guatemala. Then they uh, stop off at a dog pound and uh, Jim Belushi's looking for his dog that was either confiscated or put there by himself and... Uh, his dog's name is something I can't remember right now. <laughs> That's it. His, dog, his dog's name is Bagel. It looks like some kind of bulldog, but the attendant says, look, I'm sorry, we, we had to put him to sleep. Um, you're overdue. And like Jim Belushi's like, we we'll call him Dr. Rock from now on. Dr. Rock's like, oh, what? You put him to sleep? When's he going to wake up? Then he says, you killed him, didn't you? You killed my dog. And he's totally devastated by this, but there's nothing he can do. And uh, him and uh, Boyle take off. First, they go back to Boyle's flat and uh, it's pretty much been emptied out. There's an eviction notice on the door and on the back of that, his wife who is Italian, has written a uh, nasty word in Italian. And Boyle says, well, she's gone back to Italy to the family, taken my son. I sure will miss my son. And uh, so I've got nothing left to lose. Let's go. They drive and they drive on the way to Guatemala and Boyle's trying to persuade Dr. Rock that, you know, it will be great, you know, you can do what you want. And... Uh, Dr. Rock's like, oh, I don't know, you, you owe me a lot of money, man. Maybe maybe you just give me the money and I'll, I'll go home. I'm not sure if I want to do this. And they're smoking spliffs as they're driving and the countryside is changing and they're drinking away. And then Boyle says, hey, man, you know, you can get, you can get a virgin to sit on your face for five bucks or something. And... Uh, this kind of uh, picks up Dr. Rock's ears and he sort of laughs and says, well, really? And Boyle says, yeah, two for a 10. And uh, this really makes Dr. Rock laugh. And so they, they kind of cheerfully get on their way and then things start to change. They enter El Salvador and uh, Dr. Rock's saying, hey, you said Guatemala. I don't want to go down here to Salvador, but uh, Boyle's like, um, it's too late for that now, man. Get rid of that joint, get rid of the booze, or you end up with your balls cut off and stuck in your ears. So suddenly, they're going past this roadblock and there's a burning truck on its side and some peasants sitting in the, on the side of the road with guys with guns everywhere and there's a burning body in the middle of the road and they're pulled over to one side and checked out. So they dragged out of the car and uh, thrown over the bonnet and searched and Boyle's protesting that he knows some general or other 
and then uh, the leader of these guys turns up and I'm going to call him Mr. Smoothie. So this Mr. Smoothie guy orders him to orders them both into the back of a jeep and they go for this ride and as they're going along they see a load of uh, people with their heads down lying on the ground with soldiers hovering about and they see this young man begging for his life looks like a student type and uh, then they're bundled into the back of this APC army personnel carrier and through the window they're locked in there and through the window they see this young man being shot dead by this Mr. Smoothie guy. In the back of this uh, APC where they're held for hours, Mr. Rock's really freaking out saying, hey Boyle, you're going to get us killed man, you brought me down here, what's going on? And then Boyle loses his temper with him and says, be cool, you know, they're not going to kill us, be cool. And eventually the door opens and they get out and Mr. Smoothie takes them through the to this building through this kind of parade ground kind of place and into this uh, office type room and then out comes this general or colonel whoever he is and he looks at Boyle, Boyle looks at him and he says hey Boyle how you doing man and Boyle's like hey general how are you I remember I wrote that great article about you and the general's like yeah man you look like shit come here and they go into this back office where there's these uh, women and this general having a good time and uh, everything's kosher the women start uh, mopping up the two men and finally Mr Rock says hey this is okay next day uh, Mr. Rock's got a terrible uh, dose of diarrhoea, possibly a dose of clap as well. So Boyle takes him to this kind of old quack doctor woman and she gets out the biggest needle he's ever seen and mixes up some potions and uh, he gets jabbed and he's like, yow. And of course, uh, Boyle finds this all totally hilarious. While Dr. Rock is being treated in the city, Boyle goes off to the outskirts and he's in this uh, beautiful valley and there's all these women washing in the river and these little kind of huts built everywhere and he goes down to the river and this little boy sees him and runs towards him and then this woman looks up, this lovely young woman and this is Maria and uh, Obviously Boyle's had a relationship with her in the past and uh, he's appeared from nowhere and she's very trepidatious about his reappearance but they embrace on the side of the riverbank. He's bought a uh, television for them and some clothes and stuff and everyone seems happy to see him, uh, including Maria who's still wary but um, Boyle's the kind of guy who wins people over, so uh, they embrace a bit more. And then uh, the next scene is that Boyle and Dr. Rock are back in the city and they go to this restaurant and we meet a guy who's going to turn up a lot in the movie, whose uh, real name was uh, John Cassidy and he was a photojournalist. Cassidy is uh, played by an actor called John Savage who I remember from the uh, Deer Hunter. Great actor and uh, Boyle is trying to ask him if there's any work, any assignments going, uh, any knowledge he might have that can help Boyle get some kind of work. Meanwhile John Belushi is still having a bad time um, and there's beggars everywhere trying to ponce off him and John Belushi is like, just give me the money, man, and I'll, I'll, I want to get out of here, I want to go home. And Boyle's like, look, I don't have any money. I have like four centardos or whatever they're called, I, I don't know. Four pesos, shall we say. And uh, so Dr. Rock takes off in a bit of a huff and uh, it seems like Cassidy's going to give Boyle something. They drive off to what looks like basically a killing field, a dumping ground for assassinated and bumped off people and it's it's very, very gruesome the scene. I don't know how much of it I can show and Boyle's talking to Cassidy and Cassidy's talking about 
that you've got to get close to get the truth. And uh, he's a great admirer of uh, Kappa, uh, the photographer. I don't know much about him, but Boyle's saying, you're in his league, man. You're in his league. And this is another very harrowing kind of scene. The bodies are mutilated and rotting where they lay. Forgive the motorbikes. Uh, there's not much I can do. It's called uh, social or cultural realism round here. And then Boyle and uh, Dr. Rock go to this place where it looks a bit like a refugee camp, but it's kind of a place where people go to try and identify the disappeared. Uh, and there's a woman there who's looking through the book of uh, deceased people and sees someone she loves, maybe a husband. And there's an aid worker there, kind of humanitarian lawyer, I would guess he is, who's helping people. And Boyle asks him if he can get him in touch with the gorillas, because if he can get to the gorillas, he can get some really good news feed from them. And the lawyer guy says, you know, you know, who cares about that? Look at what I'm doing. So uh, Boyle gives him the roles of film he's taken at the killing fields and says, well, maybe this can help you. And he goes to leave, but uh, the lawyer's assistant comes after Boyle and says, look, come back next week and we'll have something for you. Then uh, Boyle goes and visits uh, a nun that he knows. There's these nuns, they're, they're in kind of normal clothing and they're working as nurses, I guess you could say, aid workers, and one of them's called Kathy, Kathy and she's young, and uh, Boyle and her have a bit of a flirty relationship from the past, and she's trying to fit a young boy up with an artificial limb because his arm's missing, and she complains that they never send the right size, and but she's happy to see Boyle, and uh, they get on very well. Then we see Boyle and Dr. Rock at a, looks like an election party. It's the year that Reagan and, uh, what was his name, the peanut guy, President Jimmy Carter. It's that election night and they're all at this uh, party around a, a poolside and uh, Boyle meets a CIA man he's known from the past and also a colonel that remembers him and uh, there's a bit of banter between Boyle and this colonel and the colonel's like you know you're a commie sort of drug addict type and Boyle's like why have you got some and uh, they obviously don't like each other very much but Boyle's asking him if he can help him you know get a story or something and the colonel's like yeah what do I get out of it the CIA man gives a whole talk to Boyle about how the domino effect is going to happen and Cuba's in there and the Soviets are in there and if they don't support this country El Salvador then the Reds are going to take over and there's going to be a domino effect all over South America and then it's going to hit North America so they've got no choice they've got to go in and give aid to the uh, government and the basically the right kind of wing of El Salvador to stop the communists taking over but Boyle thinks this is all ludicrous and uh, uh, most people just want to live their lives. Then uh, Boyle and uh, Dr Rock are sitting with a load of journalists and one of them's this uh, yuppie news anchor, or what shall we call her, yuppie newswoman and Boyle and uh, her are having this big argument because she's kind of very mainstream and sort of toes the line and he's very sort of on the edge and uh, they have this big argument and he insults her and she gets up to walk away but meantime Dr Rock has spiked her drink with a load of acid so then we see her trying to do a news report and she's all dishevelled and giggling and it ends up falling on the floor in a right old mess. Well, Ronald Reagan won that election, as we all probably know, and then we see some people celebrating in the streets of El Salvador and, and then we're in some kind of a private house with a load of sort of uh, 
what should I call them, uh, paramilitaries maybe. And the leader's this guy called Major Max, and he's making this big speech about, just to this select group, about how they've got to kill all the priests because the priests are spreading all this communist stuff around and social justice stuff and they're going to kill all the priests and then they're going to kill all the journalists and anybody else and all the subversivos that get in their way and he holds up a bullet and says with this bullet we kill the Archbishop, Archbishop Romero who I think was a real character and uh, who's going to do it, who's going to do the job and uh, several of them including Mr Smoothie stand up and he chooses this young officer and says to him hey you're going to be famous. Then we see uh, Boyle and Dr Rock and Maria and all the family, there's some young sort of youths with them, her brother and some others and they're in a restaurant owned by an American guy and Boyle's doing his usual hustle thing, trying to get some money off of the owner who's reluctant to give it, but Boyle's got the, got the gift of the gab, so to speak, and he talks him round, and on the TV in the bar is Major Max making a commercial for his political campaign, and everybody's drunk, and the youths that are with uh, Boyle, they start jumping about, singing anti-fascist songs and stuff, and doing impersonations of Hitler, and uh, then they look over, and there's these couple of real shady looking guys staring at them, so Boyle gets the boys and gets them to sit down and behave themselves, and then looks back, and these guys are just staring at them, very scary looking guys. When they all come out the bar they find that these guys and a couple of others are sitting on the bonnet of their car, on the what you call the hood of the car and uh, Dr Rock's a bit drunk and the boys are still drunk and provoke these guys and Boyle's trying to get between them and saying look stop it get in the car and he's like Cerviso, 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 whatever it is, beer, I'll get you a beer. He runs off, gets these guys some beers and he's hey cool get in the car boy, uh, get in the car Dr Rock, get in the car boys. He gets everyone in the car and he's just about to get in the car and one of them menaces him. One of them's grabbed one of the boys but they get him free and then uh, Boyle does this trick that he's always doing. He's got a load of watches and he wears them and then he, he just slides one off and hands it to this guy like a little bribe and manages to get in the car and they drive away. But next thing we know, uh, we find that uh, Dr. Rock and Maria's brother are in this cell and they've got this drunken kind of crazy looking sergeant or whatever he is leering all over him and they've been beat up and Boyle and Maria appear and uh, no not Boyle and Maria, Boyle and Kathy the, the nun appear and they've got the TV and they've got a bottle of whiskey and they give that to this drunk sergeant guy and the sergeant guy says hey he's been smoking marijuana and uh, shows him this bag of marijuana and Boyle acts all outraged and gives Dr. Rock a slap like he's really naughty and the Kathy tries to kind of sidle up to this sergeant pretending to sort that he's really nice and they give him some money and he lets Dr. Rock go and Dr. Rock runs the hell out of there as fast as he can but they won't let the boy go and no matter what they do they can't get the boy out and there's these other guys with guns and they push him out of the police station and the boy's left there. So then we see uh, Boyle and Kathy go to visit the American ambassador, Kelly. Seems like a decent guy and Boyle's trying to ask him to intervene and get the uh, Maria's brother back and also to get a sedula for Maria. Now a sedula is something they had there where you've got to get it from the town you're born in and then, or grew up in, I don't know, and it enables you to vote. Now if you don't have one of these, or you don't vote, you can be picked up and eliminated as a subversivo. For some reason she can't get this because maybe she's on a blacklist because she's with Boyle, I don't know, but the ambassador says he can do what he can, but there's not much he can do. He can't really intervene in all this. So outside he has to tell Maria 
it, what, it's not great news, but uh, he says, look, if I marry you, then you'll be my wife. You won't need a cedula and I can get you out of the country. But she says, you know, you're married already. But boy says, well, you know, he's doing his hustle thing again and his gift of the gab thing. And he, he says, oh, no, I'm divorced. And then she says, but I'm a Catholic. I can't marry a divorced man. And he's like, well, you know, what if we go to mass and I do confession and uh, we take communion together and I'll be a good Catholic and everything will work out well. This is the way Boyle is. He has this way of talking people round. So they go to the church, or I think it's more like a cathedral, and uh, there's some kind of big protest going on, and we see that human rights uh, lawyer guy making a speech, and the army are on call, and they're all standing nearby, and Mr. Smooth is there, and uh, he tries to stop the uh, demonstration, but it kind of carries on. Meanwhile, Boyle goes inside with Maria and Dr. Rock, and he does a brilliant confession. The confession is something to behold, really. Uh, he admits to his drug taking and all his sort of weaseling around and the priest tells him to make an act of contrition and change his ways. But, you know, Boyle says, well, that's very difficult to do, but I'll try. And for this woman, I, you know, I'll believe in God if God gives me this woman. and. The priest tells him to say his Al Marys, etc. And Boyle says, oh, that's it then. Oh, that was OK. And he sort of gets out of there and then he goes to have communion with uh, Maria. And, uh, you know, they're given the, uh, the wine and the bread and the Archbishop Romero goes along the line. And after he's done Boyle and Maria, there's a couple of other people. And then he goes to give the... Uh, wafer to another guy but who is it the guy looks at him and spits at him then gets a revolver out or gets a gun out and shoots the archbishop dead right in front of everybody and it's that guy that was at major max's house the one that was chosen and then absolute pandemonium erupts soldiers are in there there's some shady guys already infiltrated the church and people are trying to get out and the army are trying to stop them and uh, Boyle manages to get away with Maria and uh, Dr Rock and somehow they find a taxi which seems a little bit unlikely but Boyle's left behind and what happens is the human rights lawyer goes to help the archbishop who's lying there prostrate on the floor all shot up and dead and then Mr Smoothie comes in points at him and says you're the one that did it and he's arrested and hustled away in a car. John Cassid is there all this time taking photos but Mr Smoothie has him jumped on by a load of soldiers and takes his camera off for him so there's no evidence around. Then we see Major Max making a speech from a balcony to a load of press people and invited guests and Boyle's asking him some difficult questions like you're in charge of the death squads or are you in charge of the death squads and the yuppie newswoman is there asking much more banal questions and Major Max gets pretty cheesed off and uh, afterwards comes out and Boyle recognises some CIA men that are around him and they kind of disappear but Max comes over and looks at uh, Boyle's press card round his neck and notes it and smiles and walks away. Then we see that Boyle turns up, uh, I don't know what place this is but uh, Maria's brother is lying on a table dead and uh, there's someone else there. I don't think it's the human rights lawyer, I'm not sure but they're there to be viewed and then he goes back to Maria's and she's furious with him and blames him but he says it's not my fault and there's a real argy-bargy between them as you can imagine she's very upset and she storms off what could you do John Cassidy is there and he just gives Boyle a bottle of this Tic Tac that everybody drinks there some cheap kind of alcohol and they go off to a bar Meanwhile, Dr. Rock has got himself uh, with a lady who seems to be a bit of a uh, old Tom, as we used to call them, which has a different meaning now. Uh, what can I say? A lady of the night. 
but he seems quite happy with her. And then we see them all in the bar together. Boyle is drowning his sorrows after seemingly losing Maria and everybody's drunk and Kathy, the nun, comes in and gives them all a bottle of whiskey because they've hardly got any money and the bar woman wouldn't really serve them although Boyle gave her a watch and managed to get a bottle in the end and Kathy comes with a bottle of whiskey and she talks to him about, you know, why don't you just go home, you're not making it, you're not... You're not making it as a journalist anymore. And Boyle's like, well, I love it down here because he does. He loves all this adventure, I guess, mayhem. And uh, although it's painful, it's something he's maybe addicted to, hooked on, shall we say. And Kathy gives him this bottle and they, they have a drink and then she wants to go because she's going to the airport to pick someone up and he sees her off and she gets on a motorbike and drives away and when he turns round there's Mr Smoothie with the guys that were in the bar before and some other blokes and they're all standing there and uh, Mr Smoothie says hey gringo come for a walk with me on the beach but uh, Boyle ain't having it by now, Boyle's surrounded and he crouches down and says, you know, not only am I an Irishman, I'm a fucking Viking too. And he tries to flick his flick knife open, but it don't work. So he has to jump a couple of times and he gets that open. Uh, but he gets, a, he gets butted by a rifle butt and falls on the floor. But he jumps up and as Mr Smoothie comes forward, he sprays him because he's carrying this little... Uh, this little spray can of mace with him and he gets Mr Smoothie with it but he's knocked down again and that now Mr Smoothie's got his gun out and he's going to shoot him uh, but there's a flash just behind the uh, Mr Smoothie and it's John Cassidy has arrived with his camera and he appeals to the the vanity of Mr. Smoothie and says, hey, hey, he's not worth it, you know, I'll take some great portraits of you. And so Mr. Smoothie tucks his gun in and he's doing all his posturing thing. And John Cassidy is really trying to get round him. And meanwhile, while this is happening, Boyle is crawling behind Cassidy. And in the end, Mr. Smoothie calls his uh, guys off and they walk away and he looks back and says, I'm going to get you, boy, or I'll be back. Something like that. Not like Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. But just like, yeah, I'm going to get you, mate. And as they walk past, there's uh, just over to one side, Dr. Rock's come out and he's got a bottle and he's like, how do you like these odds? And he smashes the bottle against the tree, but it don't break. So he like looks at it and then they walk past and one of the guys says to him, hey, gringo, marijuana. And we get to... Uh, a very harrowing part of the movie. This is where Kathy has gone to the airport with another nun, a middle-aged kind of nun, and they've picked up some new uh, nuns who have come from another place in the world, uh, giving aid, and they're driving back and they're stopped by the police. And what then happens is a very brutal and horrific thing which I don't think on YouTube I, I can really say a lot about. But we can say that at the end they're all killed and the next scene we see the American ambassador and uh, Boyle and other news people are all there while they're getting the bodies out of these shallow graves and the American ambassador is really angry because there's no post-mortem being done and it's all being covered up and... Uh, the colonel guy is trying to say maybe they made a mistake and even people are saying maybe the nuns opened up on the police which is like blatantly absurd and I seem to remember that this was a real incident and uh, a terrible terrible thing. I forgot to say that when Boyle was meeting the, the uh, ambassador for the first time and asking Maria to marry him. At the same time, uh, an Australian journalist comes down and says, hey, I've got to go somewhere, but I've got an assignment and I can pass that assignment to you and there's some money in it. So do a real good job for me. And Boyle asks him for money and he says, oh yeah, you don't change, do you? So do this job for me, gives him a bit of money and uh, 
now we get to the point where that assignment is carried out and what it is is to go to one of the rebel guerrilla camps somewhere up in the mountains and there a few journalists are taken up there and he arrives at this uh, training camp. Him and John Cassidy photograph uh, all the training and some of the people that are living up there and then a uh, commander, I guess you could call, them, call it, gives a little talk to the journalists about how they're going to rise up and take over the country and Boyle's like, you know, there's 40,000 official soldiers against you, don't you think it, it's too much? But the uh, commander says, you know, the march of history and all that stuff and people will rise up and, you know, hopefully it'll be successful. Then we see uh, Boyle uh, probably at the place where that party had been around the swimming pool. Maybe it's the back of the embassy, I guess that's where it must be. And uh, he's with the colonel and he's with the CIA guy and he's showing them the pictures that he took because obviously they wanted something from him and so part of his mission was taking the photos. But Boyle's playing it down. He's saying, look what the rebels have got. They just got bolt action rifles. They don't have any rockets. They don't have any planes, etc. There's nothing to worry about. But the colonel's saying that they've got intel that there's much more going on than that. And the CIA guy also don't trust Boyle's uh, narrative on this one. And then there's an argument goes on between all three of them where Boyle's saying this is going to be another Vietnam. Look what you're doing to these people. Is it worth it? Uh, you're arming them to the teeth at people like uh, Major Max, you know, death squads and all that. But the CIA guy and the colonel are saying that People like you, the colonel was saying, really, people like you lost the Vietnam War, lefty commies like you. And the CIA's guy is saying that if we don't step in, what will come here will be much worse than anything we will ever do. But Boyle's like, no, that's not true. America has some values, has the values of freedom and liberty, and we should be helping these people and not supporting these kinds of regimes. <clears throat> In the end, you know, Boyle's asking for a sedula for his girlfriend, but the colonel don't think he's given them enough. So Boyle says, OK, I'll just have to forge it. And uh, he gives them the photo, says it's on your house, but he's chased by the colonel who says, hey, you know, this Major Max guy and these people, you're on the shit list. If I was you, I'd get my rubber shoes on and go for the airport. But uh, Boyle's like, you know, I've got to get my girlfriend out. But the... Uh, Colonel's not really impressed and Boyle says, hey man, you'll do really well here because you're just a gangster like all the others. Then we see the yuppie newswoman interviewing American troops arriving, but apparently they're not troops, they're just trainers. And then we see Boyle in the foyer of a hotel looking a bit down and uh, Dr. Rock turns up with this woman, Wilma, that he's been hanging out with and he's got some money which he says is, is from her because she had a good career, apparently. And he's got a new dog, a new bagel too. And he gives uh, Boyle some money and he's dressed well and he seems to be really happy. And then uh, John Cassidy turns up and says, hey Boyle, something's going on. We need to go. So Boyle says, right, let's do it. But I need to see Maria first. And John Cassidy says, there's no time. But he says, I, I've got the car. I need to do this. If, I, if you don't let me see Maria, I'm not going. So John Cassidy says, OK, let's do it. So they go off to Maria's place and uh, they're reunited and they make love. And, you know, it's all not back to normal because she's lost her brother but uh, there's reconciliation and then him and uh, John Cassidy take off to what turns out to be a battle. The rebels are attacking a, I guess it's a government stronghold, uh, federal troops are defending and there's quite a lot of stuff going on and John Cassidy's getting going with his camera and running forward and uh, Boyle's kind of following him and Cassidy makes to go from the rebel lines into the uh, government lines and makes it over there with Cassidy following him and there's explosions and all kinds of stuff is going on and then they hear that horses are coming and it turns out to be the um, 
what do you call them, the uh, Sandinistas that have come and entered the war from, El, uh, from uh, what do you call it, from Nicaragua, as I remember, and they're, they're on horseback and they steamroll through the uh, government lines and uh, Boyle and, and uh, John Cassidy are taking pictures and Cassidy's right out in front of the horses taking these pictures and Boyle's trying to pull him back but he wants to get that shot, get real close and then the rebels take over and one of the rebels is one of the youths that uh, had been with Boyle previously in the bar and Boyle had taken him out to the road where he could walk up and join the guerrillas and one of the guerrillas is that boy and he talks to him and Meanwhile, the ambassador is being heavily pressured by the CIA guy and the colonel guy to release the weapons and the uh, troops, maybe not the troops, the weapons that have been held back by the previous administration. But of course, Kelly, the ambassador's only got a day or two left because the whole thing is going to change over due to the Reagan victory and he knows that Reagan people have been around even before the election. and. The CIA guy is saying to him, hey, do you want to be known as the guy that loses El Salvador uh, in the history books? And the ambassador saying, history books, this is not a video game, it's real life. But he's being pressured really heavily. If he doesn't intervene, they can't keep the embassy safe and the whole country might fall. And so in the end, he's backed into a corner and he agrees to release the, the weapons. So all the special troops with their equipment are released immediately and uh, meanwhile in the battle zone that the Sandinistas have won they can hear the tanks are, are coming and uh, the tanks pour into the town, the rebels try to escape and try to hold out at different points but they've got helicopters these guys and they got tanks and all kinds of stuff so the rebels are being slaughtered while this is going on a, a plane a fighter plane comes down to the street and John Cassidy can't resist it he runs out to the middle of the street and Boyle's camera is uh, broken he can't do nothing he's in a doorway hiding from all the machine gun bullets but Cassidy's right out there in the middle and he's shooting away with his camera and he, he gets shot he gets shot up real bad and he's lying in the road and Boyle runs over and he does a tracheotomy on him and he tries to help him to breathe but Cassidy says I got the shot man I got the shot take the film to New York and he dies in Cassidy's arms I just want to say that before this happens before the Sandinistas and the rebels take off they execute all the uh, prisoners they've taken from the battle and Boyle tries to stop them but he's held back and he keeps shouting out you'll just you'll become just like them you'll become just like them and although this in a way is quite a left-leaning movie I think that really says something about all kinds of revolutions and all kinds of wars where one side thinks that they're just against a, an evil enemy but end up becoming evil themselves by using the same methods and it happens in human history again and again and again so now we see Boyle in hospital and Maria and Dr Rock come to visit him and Dr Rock gives him a appeal to his, his pain and it looks like a really rough hospital and the doctor disappears and uh, hey, Dr. Rock's like, oi, where are you going? But uh, the doctor's gone, and uh, he shows Boyle that he's forged this cedula for Maria, and he's forged an exit visa for Boyle so that they can get out of the country. Boyle's got to get out of the country because he's on Major Max's shit list, and Maria's got to get out of the country because I think of her connections with Boyle and connections maybe with the rebels. So the next scene we see they're all driving down the highway heading for Guatemala. There's uh, Dr. Rock and there's Boyle and there's Maria. She has a baby which I didn't mention before but she does have a baby. And she has the little boy who was her son before that first recognised uh, Boyle when he arrived. He must be about 10, maybe 8, something like that. 
and they're going down the road and they get to the uh, checkpoint, the uh, border crossing and they cross their fingers and Boyle says to Doc, Dr. Rock's not leaving so Boyle says to him any trouble get in touch with the ambassador. The guys at the border control are not happy with the papers and the officer in charge calls this guy Hefe and this great big kind of monstrous looking wrestler type guy comes out and he does a phone call and Boyle tries to get the hell out of there with Maria but he's held at gunpoint and taken back and then he's beaten to a pulp and uh, they find the film in his boot, the film he got from John Cassidy and they just strip that out and expose it and he gets really angry even though he's beaten up saying you fuckers, you motherfuckers and all that kind of language, saucy language shall we say and uh, he's beaten black and blue and then he's dragged out to a old bus across this dirty old pond and uh, he's got a gun to his head while all this is going on, Dr. Rock's in this battered old phone booth trying to phone the American ambassador who's just about to get on a plane because his time is up uh, and he manages to get him. His secretary grabs the uh, Mr. Kelly, the ambassador, and he comes back to the phone and he gets in touch with the right guys and says, hey, you, you stop this, you leave him alone or I'll make your life hell, I'm still ambassador here. The first bullet shot at uh, Boyle's head. The gun don't go off, and like he's like, "Oh, what? Are you serious?" And then while the guy is preparing to do the next shot, the officer uh, from the control point runs in and stops Hefe and says, "Whoa, whoa! Stop it! Stop it! We've got orders to stop it." Next scene: Boyle's. Uh, having a good old drink up with all the guys that were just going to execute him and Maria's there looking very like ooh, cowed and uh, Boyle's there laughing and joking they're all drinking Hefe is uh, slapping him on the back but he's saying to him hey you're all cocksuckers you know hope you all get like uh, hepatitis or something and uh, then he shows him in his boot then the heel, the heel twists and he had the film hidden in the heel of his boot all the time and uh, everybody's laughing and having a great time. So they get past the initial stages of the border control and uh, there we go, we've got a uh, boil, we've got Maria, we've got the baby and we've got our older son all on the bus heading for California and everything looks great. I'm going to end the story there. It's not quite the end, so you can find out for yourself what happens next. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, narration of this film and maybe we'll check it out yourself. Um, it's quite a movie. The performances are outstanding from every single person in this movie. I think it's one of the greatest movies made in the 80s and maybe of all time it's a fantastic movie as i say it's very difficult it is very difficult to watch um, there's no doubt in that and i i probably haven't done it justice but by just talking about this movie i hope that it uh it pushes people a little bit to have a look at it again or for the first time and to judge it for yourselves and um yeah, that's where I'm going to end it. So uh, thanks for watching and thanks for listening and uh, I'll see you about. Uh, one thing I'd like to add is that uh, this film has a wonderful music score. Uh, I often don't mention music enough in these uh, reviews. I should do. Um, got a beautiful score. It's uh, very haunting and very appropriate for the film. So well done uh, to those who composed it. Also the film was uh, nominated for a couple of Academy Awards uh, which I can't remember what they were for exactly but it never won any but it should have. 